If I could uh, have everybody's attention here for just a minute. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I hope everybody got a plate of food. Uh, welcome to our third Champagne Urbana JavaScript. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Larry Price, if you don't know me. Um, so let me get started with the agenda and we can get the talks underway. Um, obviously, food, drink, socialize. If you need to get up at any point and go and get more to eat or another water or soda, feel free, go ahead. Um, know that we're gonna have two talks tonight. I'm gonna give a talk on React Hooks and then we are going to have a short intermission, about five minutes, while Eric sets up, during which, of course, you can also get more food, go to the bathroom, switch seats, meet somebody new, you know? I know I'm looking out, I see everybody sitting with all their friends. That's nice, but this event is all about getting to know other people in the community, uh, learning what everyone's doing, and sort of networking. So, let's foster relationships. Um, and then after the intermission, we're gonna have Eric talk about uh, Workbox. Um, of course, tonight's event would not be possible without the space that we're currently in and the food that we're currently eating, which is brought to us by Enterprise Works at the Research Park. So if we give them a round of applause. Thank you. Um, and let's see, save the date for our next event. We're going to be meeting March 27th, which is exactly four weeks from tonight. Um, I've got a couple speakers lined up already. Uh, that's tentatively going to be at Granular. If you remember, that's where our first meetup was, if you were there. Um, it's really just across the street. Um, a stone's throw away if, you're, uh, if you have a really strong arm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and last but, last but certainly not least, if you want to help in any way, please reach out to me. Talk to me after this event, during the inter intermission. Um, find me at Harvest Market uh, in the middle of my grocery shopping. Um, and stop me and talk to me. If you want to give a talk, um, if your organization wants to host an event, I love to switch the, uh, I love to switch the venue up as frequently as possible. It really uh, sort of helps to show that we want everyone involved in the community. We want people from all kinds of organizations giving talks and getting to know each other. Um, yeah, so just either chat with me or there's this email or you can find me on Meetup and the organizer page. And with that, I'm going to make a probably not super seamless transition over to my talk. Actually, it's going to be pretty easy. Yeah, that go away. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm going to talk about React Hooks. And this says in 15 minutes, um, I would like to make a slight addendum to this and say 15 minutes or so, maybe. Let's say uh, 20 minutes. Um, this is a little bit about me. Uh, there's a lot of jokes on here, um, but I'm just going to say I'm a senior software engineer at Granular. We make farming business software. Uh, I do a lot of coding in React and Angular, um, as well as Python, and just like regular Node stuff. Um, and yeah, moving on to what you came here to hear about, which is <coughs> React Hooks. Well, but OK. Let's back up a little bit. Before we talk about hooks, let's talk about React. So React is a mildly popular front-end framework um, used by a handful of developers <coughs> to build um, modern UI in JavaScript. Um, so you can use React on the web. You can use it on phones like Android and iPhones. Um, does Windows Phone still exist? I don't know if you can use it there or not, but uh, maybe. Um, so they do claim that it's learn once, write anywhere, which is kind of true. So the whole premise of React is that it is sort of, a, it uses functional paradigms to allow you to write your UI. So there's a unidirectional data flow. And I'm going to throw out a couple of keywords here um, just to sort of get everyone familiar with what we're going to be talking about tonight. So in React, um, you have these things called components. And components encapsulate your UI logic. Um, components can include many subcomponents. Uh, components can include native elements in your UI. So when you're talking about web, that can be spans, that can be blink tags, that can be uh, buttons, inputs, anything you want. Um, so what comes into a component is two different types of data. You can have, well, what comes into a component is one type of data, and that is props. 
props are read-only, they're handed to you by the parent, you are not allowed to edit them. And then on another important type of data on a component is state. State is something that you keep track of, it's mutable, and you can touch it. And so React, you, the React runtime uses props and states in order to figure out how to, or I should say rather, when to update lower level components and certain parts of the UI. And this allows it to be very efficient and to only re-render certain parts of the UI, UI when necessary. Um, one other thing to point out here is that React has always used the cutting edge JavaScript specs, which is part of what makes it so fun to use. Um, and it's been around for over five years now. So if you started using React when it first came out, you can finally claim more than five years of React experience on your resume, get those recruiters on you. Um, so I have not been using React for quite five years, but pretty close. Um, I dug around in my GitHub history and I found a project where the last commit was in 2015. And this might be a little bit hard to read from the back. Um, it's a lot clearer on, you know, a modern monitor. Um, but anyway, this is a, what a React component looked like in 2015. So I'm just gonna walk through it real quick because these are gonna be like common things that we see even today. Um, so the first thing you'll see up there is that we have a function called react.create class, and this tells React that we're creating a component. Inside here, if you look down about halfway, you'll see this get initial state. Uh, this is just how you define an object to represent what your state looks like when you first initialize your component. Uh, below that, we have a render method. And so render is actually a React method where we tell it what we want to display. In this case, I have a, a single conditional that checks some values in my state, and depending on what they are, it renders either an edit button or an add button. And if you look closely at, say, the edit button, you'll see that I give the edit button some of my own state and some of my own props. So I'm intermingling state and props to give to my subcomponent, my child component, which will receive them both as its own props, and so they'll be read-only. Um, anything else here? So up at the top in the onSave function, we call this dot set state, which is how you actually change and manipulate your own state values. <clears throat> so, fast forward to today. And I went ahead and refactored that old uh, component to use the sorts of patterns that we would use in 2019 to create a React component. And so the first thing you'll notice is that now React embracing the latest JavaScript specs. Don't worry about that, I don't know what, I don't know. Hey guys, give me just a second here. Okay, minor technical difficulty, we'll edit it out in post. Um, so, as I was saying, 2019, creating a component in React. Um, this should look very similar to what we just saw, but React using the latest JavaScript specs. You can see at the very top, we're now creating a class that extends the React component uh, class, uh, where we previously used, uh, what was it, get initial state to define our initial state. Now we're setting our initial state in a constructor. Uh, we have a bound function for that on save property, and I'm using a fancy ES decorators one that Chad used in last month's CUJS. Come to all of our events, because then you'll get these little, these little inside things. Um, inside of that bound function, we're actually using what's called functional set state, which is a newish thing, and that functional set state ensures that our uh, state will be updated in the order in which, it was, in which the calls were received. And then our render is actually identical, except that I changed things to a ternary because I don't know, I got a little bit ahead of myself when I was refactoring. So we don't always need state, right? So sometimes you just need like a little component, something that doesn't do very much, maybe something that all it does is render some DOM. In this case, I have a cancel account button. And all that it is is a button with a span tag in it that has like a little icon and then some text. And so these we refer, these are really simple. All it is is a, what I've got here is an arrow function. 
takes in a single prop called on click, which it assigns to the buttons on click handler, um, and then just returns the DOM that it's going to use. These are referred to as functional components, and you may be familiar with calling them stateless components, but for reasons you'll see uh, shortly, you should maybe refrain from calling them stateless components. Because you pretty much always end up refactoring a functional component to need state. As it grows, as your project grows, except for the like, very lowest level things, eventually you're gonna find yourself in a situation where you say, oh, like, I really need to use the lifecycle method, I really need to use state. And this is a big pain in the butt. Um, so let's present a situation, just a little scenario. So marketing comes to us, is that GIF line? Yeah. Score. Um, marketing comes to us and they say, hey, engineering, we know that you guys implemented that cancel account button last week and we've been scouring through the analytics and we found that that cancel account button is the primary reason for our revenue loss. We lose a subscription every time someone clicks cancel account. That button needs to, we need to make sure that you. <laughs> this is sadly believable. <laughs> um, so we need to, like, we need users to understand, we want them to truly understand what it means when they're clicking this button. Because maybe they just, maybe they don't recognize the value that they're getting from our service. And so we want to make extra, extra sure that they know that they're going to lose their account. So, design, marketing, product, us, for some reason the CEO's there, we all get together in a room and we come up with this design. We say that every time a user is going to click a button multiple times, and the button will cycle through different messages based on how desperate we are to keep them. Um, when we finally exhaust all of our messages, we'll go ahead and cancel the account because we're not pure evil yet. So I know that that little zoom indicator is in the way. Uh, this says refactoring into a class component, my bad. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken our original functional component and I made it into a class component to have the state that we needed. And I know this is a lot of code. And that's, that's the point, by the way. Hold on. Um, so let's just walk through this real quick. So again, we've changed our function into a class. We're extending the React component class. We've added a constructor. We have to call super. It's required. Um, we set our initial state with our button text as cancel and our click set to zero. Um, let's walk down to the bottom here where we have our render function. It's largely the same, except that now in, our, uh, in place of our cancel text, we now show whatever the current state of the button text is. And instead of the old on click handler, we are now actually going to call set state with the next number of clicks. And so whenever we call that set state, what's going to happen is a lifecycle function is going to be called. Uh, because our state was updated, our component is going to want to re-render. So we have component did update here, and that's called every time a component is rendered, except for the first time, which we would use component did mount to do that. Um, and in this function, we have to like, sort of beat around the bush a little bit, and we have to first verify that the number of clicks is what changed, and if it did change, then we're going to check that we have more messages than clicks, and if so, then we're going to update the button text. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and call our pass-through prop on click so that the user can finally cancel their account. And this is admittedly a lot of code for doing very little, although retention, I mean, give up any kind of code quality for that, right? If only there were a better way to do that, maybe a brand new way to do that. Hooks is the answer to our problem. So I took that old functional component, I went back on a second pass of adding state to this class or to this component, and I did it in hooks. And the first thing I want you to notice is that this is about half the code of creating a class component. So you'll notice a couple of new pieces of syntax here. We're going to sort of zoom in on a couple of different parts of this code to talk about what it's doing. So the first thing that you'll see is use state. And so this is how you declare state variables using React hooks. So here we call use state, and it will return to us a state variable and a set. So in this case, we have two state variables, clicks and button text. Um, 
We use the parameter to use the first parameter into use state to uh, tell it what the initial state should be for those values. Uh, in our case, for clicks, we want it to be zero. We want to know it's an integer, so we can later add to it. And for button text, we don't really care what it is. We're just going to let it be null or undefined. Um, and then we also get these setters that we set aside. So what this does is it hooks our component, this instance of our component, into the React runtime. And every time that the component is re-rendered, it'll essentially ask, hey, has this instance already gotten its state variable? And if it has, it will uh, return us that state variable associated with this instance. So zooming back out, we see the next thing on our list is a use effect. Use effect is also part of the hooks API. And use effect essentially it's component did mount and component did update combined. So it's all the lifecycle methods that we should need for a regular component. <clears throat> use effect will be being called every render. Um, you should recognize this logic if you squinted at the last slide with the class component um, as being pretty much the same. We're checking to see if we have more messages than clicks, and if we do, we're going to update the button text, and if we don't, we're going to call this on click prop, um, and that's it. You can see what we don't have here is the check to see if clicks actually changed, and that's what this second parameter to use effect is, the array with clicks inside of it. The second parameter is a list of state variables to watch, and if those state variables have changed, then this effect will be fired. Um, otherwise, it will be ignored. So one thing to note here is that we're using sort of the power of closures to, to access all of these things, so we don't have to deal with this. We don't have to deal with uh, any binding or anything like that. We just sort of already have all of these values because they're, they're coming from the function that uh, defines this effect. Um, you sh can and should define as many hooks as you, or as many effects as you want inside of your component to do things like separate different concerns, so like if I want to change another state variable based on the fact that messages change, that should be done in a different effect. And that way, you can sort of see, you can read your function like you would a page. Okay, so zooming back out, the render function is pretty much exactly the same as it was before, except that now instead of calling Um, yes, what's your question? Uh, with the second argument, is it doing a direct comparison or a... So the question is if the second argument is doing a direct comparison. Um, so, so the second, so it should be, it will be checking the value return, or the value in the React runtime versus whatever you have set it to. So like if you look in um, down here at our render function, you can see in our um, on click, we call set clicks with clicks plus one. So in this case, when we call set clicks, um, the value of clicks will have changed. And so then the component will be re-rendered. So the React runtime will start back at the top. It'll get the old clicks state variable. And the effect will be run based on that. I'm more thinking, like say, if I have Oh, I actually don't know the answer to that. That's a good question, though. So the the real question is like, will it essentially test do it do it deep equals? And yeah, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question because that's definitely an issue that's come up a lot in uh, class components too right, when you're doing renders. In the, old, in the old case, right, you will have component did update, you will get back the previous state or previous part. Uh huh. So I was wondering. And then you could do your own comparison using, but then this doesn't have a memory of the previous state or previous property. So I was wondering if I want to do some custom comparison, how would I do Yeah, that? you would have to do things with like refs and things like that. Um, oh, so yeah, let's, sure. let's table this, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, interesting question though. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so you'll see the render is pretty much the same. Like I said, we use the set clicks function now instead of using set state, and we're using the button text uh, function directly instead of using the stat state of it, button text. Um, and so this is really cool in my opinion because first we've cut our code approximately in half from the class component, um, and I find this much, much more readable. 
you can sort of read it from top to bottom now. And you can see exactly what should be happening. Um, so, great. Marketing loves our new button. Retention improved for some reason. We probably introduced a bug somewhere where the cancel never actually happens. I don't know. But anyway, they love it. And they say, hey, we should do this on more pages. What if, like, let's talk about our EULA. We worry that no one actually reads our EULA. They just check the checkbox and then click agree and then click go on. So we want them to say, like, click the checkbox and then the button text will change and say, I really agree. And then you click it again and they'll say, yeah, no, like, I actually read it. No. But, um, yeah, so what if we wanted to do that? How could we reuse this logic? So there's a concept of custom hooks. And again, I know that this text is maybe a little bit small. Um, but so what we can do is extract entire effects out of our out of our component. And you can see here what I've gotten, what I've got is a use text by count hook. And uh, what this does is it declares its own state variable, text, which from before is the button text. It's akin to that. And then we have the same use effect, but we're using slightly different variable names, and then we're returning the current state of text. Um, and then if you look in the cancel account, bu account deletion button, um, we now only are keeping track of one state variable, and that's clicks. Button text comes to us from this custom hook, and we don't even know that it's a state variable, and we don't care. We just use it. Um, and so that's cut out another 12, 14 lines. We put this out, we take this into a lib file, uh, we realize that the whole world wants it, we MIT license it and put it up on NPM. And then we take it out of our code base entirely. And so what this has done is it's allowed us to reuse stateful or lifecycle management logic, which traditionally in a class component is really hard. Because you've got to think about this. You've got to think about other sort of effects that are happening in a component did update. Um, and we've done that really simply and easily with hooks. Um, so as we're starting to wrap up here, there are some rules, and they're pretty simple. Um, so the first rule is only call hooks at the top level. So don't use hooks and conditionals, don't use them in loops. And we want this because if you, so the way that the React runtime returns state variables to you is by which the or, by the order in which they are called. So if you call your hooks in a different order, so you call use state in different or in a different order, then you're going to get state variables.